Hello everybody, this is part two of lecture four for co-occurring disorders with Dr. Greg. We're moving on to talking about obsessive compulsive disorders. On this slide, I'm going to be covering a lot of uh, the obsessive compulsive disorders. Um, you know, basically, these are uh, sub uh, disorders that all fall in line with the same category. Um, I'm not going to go into too much depth, I'm mostly just going to describe all these other ones right here on this slide. Um, OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder itself is the first of these disorders and I'm going to talk more detail about that one but the rest I'm just going to talk about right here. So first off is body dysmorphic disorder. This is another type of obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, the one thing that these all have in common is that they all have some sort of obsessive thought that is difficult to um, alleviate in common. That's what all these have. And there should be some kind of recurring um, compulsive behavior as well. So they all fall in line with that same idea of having both one or both of an obsessive thought and some compulsive behavior in response to it. When it comes to body dysmorphic disorder, there is a recurring belief that there's some sort of flaw occurring in somebody's physical appearance and there is some sort of repetitive behavior or act. Uh, most often it's a checking or comparing. Um, oftentimes there really isn't any sort of flaw actually on the person's body but it could be as simple as a mole they think they have or a scar or maybe they don't think their hair is perfectly symmetrical, something of that nature. Um, there is the belief that there is some sort of flaw and it may or may not be actually there. And so they're very often uh, checking over and over again. Now the one disorder this most often gets compared to would be something like anorexia nervosa um, or bulimia. Because with those disorders, there's also a perception, a negative perception about the body. However, when it comes to those eating disorders, um, this belief is specifically about the person's weight or size. Um, so that's much more specific. With this, it's not necessarily going to be about weight or size, nor is the person performing the same behaviors that occur with anorexia or bulimia, which I'll talk more about in the future. With this, it's simply a obsessive um, uh, thought that there is just some kind of weird uh, flaw in someone's visual appearance with a lot of checking behavior, the, either in the mirror or in the phone or something like that. There is an interesting specifier that has been recently added for body dysmorphic disorder that more oftentimes pertains to males called muscle dysmorphia. Um, this is the belief that somebody's muscle mass is insufficient and is oftentimes um, characterized with excessive amounts of exercise to build muscle. So an interesting one to look up if you ever get the chance. A couple other obsessive compulsive disorders include hoarding, which is the perceived need to save items resulting in collection of items that congest living areas. A very interesting thing to keep in note is that hoarding, uh, this hoarding behavior, is also a symptom involved with obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which we're not talking about in too much depth right here or in this class because it's not often associated with substance use disorder. However, keep in mind that hoarding behavior in itself may also constitute a different personality disorder as well, uh, where this is specifically just the uh, compulsion to save items uh, that congest living areas. Trichotillomania is a form of obsessive compulsive disorder where somebody is recurrently pulling at their own hair. They may even be ripping out large chunks of their hair over time. So this one can be a very harmful disorder to experience or even witness. Excoriation is also very similar, but this involves recurrent skin picking, uh, which can result in a lot of wounds all over the body. Uh, then there's also just substance induced and medical conditions uh, related to obsessive compulsive behaviors. <clears throat> so let's go into more depth when it comes to just OCD itself. Like I said before, OCD is the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. So what's really important to keep in mind there, in fact I've said this wrong in a lecture in the past, I once said that OCD requires both obsessions and compulsions together. Turns out you don't necessarily have to have both to have OCD. Someone could be just experiencing obsessions or just experiencing compulsions without some sort of obsessive belief. And when you think about it, that kind of makes sense because when it comes to trichotillomania or excoriation, there is no exact belief going on about it. That's just a repetitive compulsive behavior that the person's having troubles controlling. So back to obsessions, like I've already kind of mentioned, 
Obsessions are recurring and persisting thoughts, urges, or images that are intrusive and unwanted and cause distress or anxiety. So that can come in any form, right? Uh, oftentimes it's going to involve <clears throat> the belief that some major harm is going to come to somebody or to oneself if they don't perform certain behaviors or they may get some sort of infection <clears throat> or miss important dates throughout their day if they don't perform certain behaviors, right? So that's the other half of it. Many obsessions come with the, if I don't this, then this will happen. And it's, when we talk about this type of thing, this belief, it's not often a rational, explicit thought. It's this repeated behavior. And really all the person tends to be able to tell you is they just feel better after they perform their compulsion. So what's the compulsion? Repetitive behavior one feels driven to perform. It's often aimed at preventing or reducing anxiety in response to obsessive worries. Uh, the act isn't realistically connected to preventing that worry though, right? So if you're worried that you're, um, you know, that uh, if you don't step over a crack on the sidewalk, you don't touch the cracks, that a hurricane is going to happen in Hawaii. Well, that's not a realistic way of preventing a hurricane in Hawaii. In fact, it wouldn't be able to tell me how you'd be able to stop that. That's the thing though, is that there shouldn't be an actual connection, you know, realistically between what the person's obsessing over and their compulsion to try and prevent it. Um, the obsessive com uh, obsessions and compulsions are time consuming or cause significant distress or impairment, right? That's kind of that universal criteria we often see. This needs to be at a point where it is impairing somehow. Now, an important thing to keep in mind with this is the, the concept of insight, which is a way of saying to what extent is the person aware that their obsession, their obsessions and their compulsions are not reasonable or realistic. And we see that there can be a very wide variety of um, uh, insight. It could be good uh, insight, poor insight, or absent, or delusional, right? When you think about these obsessions, uh, it's some belief, right, that if you don't perform this particular behavior, something bad's going to happen. This can be so intense that it's uh, we could basically consider a delusion, right? They are so convinced that something bad's going to happen, you can't convince them otherwise despite having evidence. So we're going to talk about that more later, what a delusion actually is, but that's the basics of it. Um, a delusion is when you continue to believe something despite clear and obvious evidence of it not being true. Uh, now, somebody who has good or fair insight will be able to tell you, they'll say, yeah, I know that I don't need to wash my hands every 15 minutes. That's not actually going to improve my chances, but I just feel driven to do it, right? That's someone who has a better insight over the obsessive compulsive pattern going on in their disorder. All right, moving on to mindfulness-based uh, uh, CBT or MCBT, uh, mindfulness is a very important concept. Oftentimes it's uh, useful for both treating substance use disorders and um, anxiety disorders. But the very basics of mindfulness in itself is the act of bringing conscious awareness to the present moment without judging or trying to change anything. Um, the opposite of this kind of mindfulness experience is what we call experiential avoidance. Now, uh, the Biglin article is going to talk a lot about that too, and how it links up with another concept called the diathesis stress model. Um, but basically, experimental avoidance is the habit that we all tend to have of trying to control or repress our feelings, especially negative feelings or sadness, things like that, right? Another important concept with mindfulness is the idea of fluid awareness, allowing thoughts and feelings to come and go without resisting against them. Um, the most important concept here is that you are merely bringing your attention or awareness. You are, you are fostering awareness of your own ability to be aware of things. Um, and I've uh, put the link down here for John Kabat-Zinn's video. Now, obviously you won't be able to use this uh, link right here um, as I talk through this video. I do have this video up on the week four, so you will find this video in the content section for week four. And I do want you to watch that video because it's a very nice little summary on these concepts of mindfulness uh, brought to you by one of the experts that have westernized mindfulness uh, ideas. His name's John Kabat-Zinn. So watch that video once you're done with this lecture or watch it before the lecture. I just hope you watch it one way or the other. 
Uh, mindfulness and addiction, or what, uh, how mindfulness can be most useful in addiction is being able to foster acceptance and awareness of cravings when they happen. Because two things are bad when it comes to cravings. One is attempting to resist or white knuckle them, uh, which is basically a way of, of straining yourself through a craving, causing more distress. The one thing we know about cravings is stress enhances cravings. So we want to help somebody just be okay with the experience of having a craving without trying to make it go away. And that's where mindfulness can be a very useful tool to do that. Another very good uh, concept that will be in the Biglin reading is cognitive diffusion, which is thinking of a craving or any sort of negative internal experience as merely a sensation, false alarm, but it's not reality. Uh, cravings come and go just like other internal experiences. But what's even more crucial cognitive diffusion, which you'll read about in the Biglin article, is the idea of intimately assessing and analyzing the very core physical feeling of an internal sensation, giving it texture, giving it motion, giving it color. It's a very strange concept, right? To look internally at your own feelings, such as anger and say, my anger is like a little red ball of glowing fire, right? And to be able to picture that inside yourself, that's what cognitive diffusion really is, is giving extra dimensionality to your feelings so that you can, in a sense, objectify your feeling a bit better. One of the difficulties with emotions is that we feel overwhelmed by them, immersed in them so deeply that we become our feelings, right? Cognitive diffusion is a way of taking those feelings and putting them into a place where you can hold them almost, right? Making them smaller, making them also more noticeable, clearer, I'd say. Not necessarily more noticeable, but just when you add the detail to a feeling, it just doesn't hold the same power anymore. It becomes an interest rather than a um, affliction. That's one way I'll put it. Mindfulness can extend to others, reduce interpersonal conflict as well by just accepting the difficulties with other people. When it comes to acceptance and commitment therapy, there are two main points. One is teaching mindfulness as a method of exploring and accepting your own values and experiences to reduce the stress of daily life. Um, every reactive emotion has a purpose or reason for existing, so just being able to accept that all your feelings have a purpose allows you to coexist with your feelings um, a bit more peacefully. Um, the other part is examining and exploring emotional reactions with curiosity rather than dread, right? So it's really about reducing the distress we experience about our own feelings. We're not trying to get rid of feelings. We're trying to understand them better, not fear them as much, not try to force them out of ourselves as much, but just be with them, face them, sit with them, and let them pass on their own. Uh, goal two is establishing commitment to important values. So one, we teach mindfulness. Two, we help people through something that's kind of like motivational interviewing, which I'll talk about a bit more later, which is just helping people, you know, commit to their own um, goals in life that really value, that they truly value for themselves. Um, and that's really a big piece of that is teaching a balance between compassion and assertiveness in life to get what they need while also respecting the needs of others. Um, so I've been talking about the Biglin article pretty much this whole time. I'm not going to go into super detail about the article itself as much as I already have really, but what's important to keep in mind when you're reading the article that may be on the exam, who knows, is uh, the concept of experiential avoidance. Really delve into that a bit more. I've only kind of introduced it here in this lecture. Um, and uh, also uh, there's a section that talks about the diathesis stress model, also a very important concept. Uh, really delve into understanding how these two things um, interact with each other, experiential avoidance and the diathesis stress model. Um, keep the two primary goals of ACT in mind, and also when you're reading the Biglin article, um, of course this is part of the reading assignment, which is defining specifically those six strands of ACT. I already gave you a little bit of that in this um, uh, lecture, which was cognitive diffusion. Um, really important concept there. It was one of the six strands of ACT, I believe. So that's um, what I want you to be able to really focus on for that read. Uh, here's a differential diagnosis. I'm gonna read this to you, and then um, you'll be able to use this because uh, next uh, slide is going to give, be your lecture response, which is going to be based on this differential diagnosis. I'm gonna read you this little fake case study I wrote. 
Kelly has been clean from opiates for over three months, but reports notable distress over sudden but brief episodes of feeling like she is having a heart attack. Her heart races very fast. She begins to shake, has cold sweats and rapid breathing. She feels terrified that she is dying and went to the emergency room over the weekend. The doctor prescribed her a benzodiazepine but she is worried about taking them because of her addictive tendencies. She reports the episodes are totally random and can happen any time during the day. She reports the first instance happened over a month ago. So I want you to, you know, um, like I kind of did last time, propose a diagnosis for Kelly in the lecture for a slide title, differential diagnosis, the one up here, provide at least three details regarding symptoms that support your answer or additional information you want that would strengthen your diagnosis. That's if you're not sure, what else would you want to know? Is there a symptom missing perhaps or something about the duration? Also make sure to mention whether or not this is a co-occurring disorder of some sort. Uh, please keep your response uh, under 300 words. I want you to make sure to keep this brief, concise, to the point. Um, so then you can spend a bit more time really on the uh, on the reading assignment. You know, just give me a little bit here to make sure I know that you've uh, looked through this. And you have some good familiarity with the symptoms of these disorders we talked about. All right, so that's the second part for lecture four. Hope you enjoyed this lecture and have a good week.